Thank you for joining us for CBN News Today. I'm Ephraim Graham. The U.S. is taking aggressive new action against the deadly Ebola outbreak in West Africa. This comes as experts warn if we don't stop the virus now, it could spread unchecked and be a problem for years to come. Our Caitlin Burke reports. It's an aggressive new effort to combat Ebola. People are literally dying in the streets. Now here's the hard truth. In West Africa, Ebola is now an epidemic uh, of the likes that we have not seen before. On Monday at the CDC headquarters in Atlanta, President well, Obama outlined the steps the U.S. Streets. will take in West Africa. They include a new command center in Liberia, an American general on the ground coordinating both U.S. and international relief efforts, and thousands of U.S. military personnel in Liberia to support the command center. Dr. Kent Brantley, an American survivor of Ebola, criticized what he calls the government's slow response. He says that early on he and other health workers pleaded for more resources to fight the virus, but he was ignored by the U.S. until he and other infected Americans were brought home last month for treatment. On Tuesday, lawmakers held a hearing on Ebola. Experts from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention warned that if Ebola isn't stopped now, we could be dealing with it for years to come. Dr. Brantley told senators that it's only a matter of time before the deadly virus spreads to the U.S. Indeed, it is a fire. It is a fire straight from the pit of hell. We cannot fool ourselves into thinking that the vast moat of the Atlantic Ocean will protect us from the flames of this fire. The World Health Organization says the window of opportunity to end the Ebola outbreak is closing. They predict the number of Ebola cases could start doubling every three weeks in West Africa and could cost nearly a billion dollars to contain. We must move quickly and immediately to deliver the promises that have been made and to be open to practical, innovative interventions. This is the only way to keep entire nations from being reduced to ashes. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. The ISIS terror threat has the president in Tampa today meeting with military leaders at Central Command. His visit comes just one day after America's top general suggested there could be a need for ground troops in Iraq. If we reach the point where I believe our advisors should accompany Iraq troops on attacks against specific ISIL targets, I'll recommend that to the president. For now, House lawmakers are on track to give President Obama authority to order U.S. military training and arms for rebels battling ISIS militants. Meanwhile, the terror group has released this response to the president's plan. It's a 52-second video filled with images of slow-motion explosions, a clip of the president saying troops will not be returning to fight in Iraq, and the words, flames of war, fighting has just begun. ISIS is also using social media to encourage attacks against America in places like New York's Times Square. ISIS creates a totally new area of threat for us. They are in also a position to inspire the increasing sophistication of their media outreach through the Internet, through all of the social media. ISIS has inspired al-Qaeda branches in Yemen and North Africa to unite. They issued a rare joint statement Tuesday calling for jihadists in Iraq and Syria to join forces against the U.S.-led coalition. A special congressional investigation into the Benghazi attacks begins today. The House Select Committee on Benghazi opens two years after the attack that killed four Americans, including Ambassador Chris Stevens. It is not clear if the investigation will ever ask why the administration failed to respond to the attack with military force and if officials lied about the motive behind the attack. The Obamacare website still has major security flaws that put users' private information at risk. That warning comes from the nonpartisan Government Accountability Office. Healthcare.gov is used by more than 5 million Americans. The site has collected their private information like names, birth dates, and social security numbers. Investigators at the GAO uncovered more than 20 specific security flaws, and they say the Obama administration took a major risk by going live with the site last fall when the system was still not fully tested. In fact, Healthcare.gov was hacked this summer. Hackers install malicious software to allow them to attack other federal websites. 
Wildfires and flooding are devastating the Southwest, causing dangerous conditions for millions and forcing thousands to evacuate. Massive flames burned through 375 acres in just five hours in, northern, in a northern California town. The fire destroyed or damaged more than 100 homes and two churches. Crews are also battling 15 other uncontained fires along the West Coast and other worries for the Southwest area. Up to 70 miles per hour winds and heavy rains from Tropical Storm Odile are causing severe flooding. Storms derailed derailed a train in one area, and at a San Diego airport, the wind sent planes crashing into vehicles. Well, it is still officially summer, but it's already been snowing out west, and weather forecasters are predicting another ferocious winter for the east. Nevertheless, the United Nations will meet next week and tell us once again that the earth is warming, even through, even though the data does not agree with that assessment. Our dear Heard has this story. It's already snowing, and one of America's premier weather forecasters is warning that for parts of the U.S., another bad winter is on the way. It's going to be a major winter for much of the eastern and southern part of the United States. We think it's a formidable winter, but the core of the worst cold uh, relative to averages, instead of being in the northern plains and Midwest, will be further south and east. Last winter was bad, too. Historically bad. The Great Lakes wasn't ice-free until June, when the Mountain West was still seeing heavy snow. But the UN keeps warning us that if we don't do something to stop global warming, the end is near. The report confirms that the effects of human-caused climate change are already widespread and consequential. But what effects from climate change? The Earth stopped warming 18 years ago, and the weather data has made a mockery of climate change warnings. The number of extreme weather events are down. Sea levels are not rising dangerously. And not only is Antarctic ice not melting, it's the largest it's been since measurements began 35 years ago. It certainly might seem as if world leaders, including our president, sound like they live on another planet when they warn that something has to be done to stop climate change. Climate change is already affecting Americans all across the country, in every region, although in different ways. This is called a climate scream. It's similar to a primal scream, except it's done by radical environmentalists demanding world leaders do something to stop climate disaster. But the real disaster has been the inaccuracy of all those scary predictions that didn't come true. By last count, there were 42 separate explanations in the scientific or public literature on why it hasn't been warming. When there are 42 explanations for some one phenomenon, I can tell you what that means. Scientists don't know what they're talking about. There's a real problem with the computer models for climate change. Why has the Earth stopped warming? One reason, cooler surface temperatures in the Pacific. One of the major cycles of the Earth, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is a temperature cycle in the North Pacific Ocean, it's gone into a cool phase about 2005. The sun, has moved into a cool phase in terms of sunspots. Weather Bell's Joe Bistardi is forecasting a long-term trend toward colder temperatures. Over the next 20 to 30 years, I think the general trend is down back towards where it was in the late 70s. The 1970s was when some were warning of a coming ice age. Yet President Obama thinks the problem of global warming is so urgent, he's reportedly been plotting to make an international climate deal without gaining U.S. Senate approval as required by the Constitution. But the president may be lonely when he attends next week's climate summit in New York. A number of world leaders aren't coming. Perhaps they're afraid of looking silly. Dale Hurd, CBN News. The Satanic Temple in Orange County, Florida, is planning to hand out Satanic children activity books at some schools. That is in response to the school district allowing a Christian group to give out Bibles. The group says its whole point is to counter what it calls biblical indoctrination. Redskins quarterback Robert, Robert Griffin III was told to remove his No Jesus, No Peace t-shirt before a news conference. Reporter Michael Phillips from the Richmond Times-Dispatch posted that an NFL uniform inspector made Griffin turn the shirt inside out. The NFL has bylaws that say on game days, players cannot wear clothing that sends a personal message, quote, unless such message has been approved in advance. 
CSN Washington reported that a Redskins spokesperson denied reports that they forced Griffin to flip his T-shirt, and they say that he did it on his own to avoid a possible fine. Coming up, the need to stop ISIS before it's too late. Radical Islamists are on the march, beheading hostages and persecuting minorities across Syria and Iraq. The Muslim monsters of ISIS have even declared an Islamic caliphate, and that has huge implications for our world. For more, we're joined now by Jay Sekular, who has a new book about their chilling plans. It is called The Rise of ISIS, A Threat We Can't Ignore. Now, Jay, we know that you're the head of the American Center for Law and Justice, so why write a book on Islamic terrorists? We have an office in Jerusalem, so we've been heavily engaged in the whole Middle East issue for a long time. And uh, about a year ago, we started looking at who are the other groups besides al-Qaeda. We know al-Qaeda had been weakened. Mm -hmm. And where was that, basically, that expression of the uh, jihadists, where are they now going? Mm -hmm. And we found ISIS. And although it wasn't getting much attention a year ago, we started really delving into it. And then this past summer, just a few months ago, yeah. we were in at Oxford University and did a series of presentations on ISIS. And of course, that's just as it started uh, developing. And what people need to understand is that ISIS is an offshoot. It was the it was Al Qaeda in Iraq, AQI, mm -hmm. but they were thrown out of Al Qaeda by Osama bin Laden a couple of years ago because even for Osama bin Laden, they were too brutal. ISIS was too brutal, mostly because they were going after Muslims as well. Mm -hmm. So this ISIS did not just develop out of nothing. They've been around, and of course, everything changed significantly when the leader Abu Bakr al Baghdadi announced that he was the caliph and established the caliphate. Mm. That was a big change when he gave that sermon in Mosul. And it's the most dangerous group we have ever faced. It dwarfs in comparison. I mean, Al-Qaeda is not a tenth as capable mm. as ISIS is. Wow, how would you compare it to Hamas? Uh, you know, similar strategies, mm -hmm. much more funding going towards uh, ISIS, frankly. So we look at both, actually, in the book, because you should not look at these groups as separate. So ISIS and Hamas, there's a causal connect. I mean, that's a great question. Number one, same ideology. It's radical jihadists desiring to establish a caliphate. So it's the same. Mm -hmm. Number two, the focus of Hamas is on Israel, eliminating Jews. That's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. With ISIS, it is more targeted, because of where they are, towards Christians, Yazidis, and other religious minorities, including Muslims that don't agree with them. Mm -hmm. So you've got this going after two different groups of people, but for the same goal. So Hamas is a version of ISIS. The difference is the Jews of Israel have the Israel Defense Forces, and the Christians of Iraq and, and Syria do not yeah. have any real military help right now. And that's why uh, the danger is the same. But there's another difference between Hamas and ISIS, and that is, and this is the real difference, Hamas, while they have funding and they have rockets, ISIS has billions of dollars land and 31,000 fighters. And by the way, Hamas, it's reported right now, has about 20,000 reserves, 10,000 actual fighters. So if you look at Hamas and ISIS together, it's 60,000 troops just in that region. That's wow. how serious the threat is. Well, let's talk more, more about the funding. How yeah. well-funded is ISIS and how are they using this money? Well, they're well-funded because they're thieves. So they went in, when they went on their rampage and when they were being unchecked because our administration and others were just not responding to the threat, what happened was they were able to get a lot of assets, about $2 billion worth of assets. They took money right out of banks. They took antiquities and sold them on the black market. They, they, they negotiate with hostages for hundreds of millions of dollars to get people released. So they are in the business of terror. And they have this tremendous resource. They also control oil wells. Now, those, that oil that they control is reports right now that it's running about $3 million, ready for this, a day mm -hmm. is what they're generating from their oil reserves. So this is, you know, the president doesn't want to call them a nation state, but they are acting like a na nation state and starting to look like one. And this idea that the Islamic uh, ISIS, uh, the, we now call themselves the Islamic State, of course, mm -hmm. that that's not Islamic. Well, that's exactly what it is. But they are controlling vast resources and they're using it to build ammunition, but mostly also to recruit. They're, we thought they were 10,000, the U.S. estimates. They're at over 31,000, maybe as high as 35,000. Again, you combine that with Hamas, that's 60,000 fighters in the region. We haven't even talked about Hezbollah yet. Mm -hmm. All of this together has to be looked at. You can't look at this in isolation. Wow. What will happen if we don't defeat ISIS? We've heard the president outline a plan. Would they be a threat to the U.S.? No doubt about it, uh, for two reasons. Number one, we're a big target. Uh, they want to control 
This is a, the establishment of a caliphate. When uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the, the caliph now, as he calls himself, was held captive in Iraq, he said as he was being released, and we put this in the book, he said, I will see you guys in New York. Mm -hmm. That was from the guy that's not the caliph. He's the guy that's in charge of this. That's what he said, number one. Number two, their desire, while they want to control what they call the greater Levant, which is the greater Middle East, right. they want to control the United States because they want the flag of jihad of ISIS over the White House. And they will do everything they can. We've got a porous border on the south. We know there are ISIS agents there. We know there are three to 500 American people with U.S. passports Absolutely. fighting for ISIS right now. It's an incredible threat, and we've got to take it really, really seriously. That's why we did the book. In terms of taking it seriously, what should our plan be to defeat ISIS? Okay, there is no middle ground. So in one sense, it's really easy. We have no option. You can't negotiate. One of the professors at uh, Oxford that we were in, in the program with, and we were discussing this, who's a, a pretty moderate guy, and he said, you know, he's a guy that believes you can negotiate deals. He said with ISIS, this is his words, crush them. Crush them. Now, this is a guy that believes you can negotiate with just about anybody. Mm. So we have to crush them. And that means we're going to have to take whatever steps are necessary. And I, this idea of pulling things off the table, I think, is a huge political mistake. We're sending a bad signal to our allies and a horrible signal to the, to the ISIS forces because they want to know we're not going to engage troops. Nobody wants to put boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you this. If we can't control them from the air, you're going to have to put boots on the ground. We can't let this. This is not a manageable threat. ISIS is a threat, as we say in the book, we can't ignore. It's not going to go away, and it's going to, it's going to get stronger if we don't stop it now. Oh, indeed. Thank you so much for the insight. Once again, the book is called The Rise of ISIS, a threat we cannot ignore. Jay Sekulo, thank you. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated. Up next, making the deserts bloom, how Israel is turning dry wasteland into farmland, just like the Bible predicted. Their land is mostly desert, but that does not stop Israel's farmers from making the desert bloom. As Chris Mitchell shows us, Israel's farmers are constantly developing new ways to grow better produce and reap even bigger harvests. Farming in the desert is about battling the elements. A harsh climate, little water, and poor soil. We are not the first, but uh, maybe one of the first nations ever who really found the way to cultivate the desert and make it bloom. When many Jewish people returned to the Promised Land in the 1800s, the land was dry and barren. Today, more than half of Israel is still desert. But just like the Bible says, Israelis have found unique ways to make the desert bloom and prosper. This is Moshav Hatzava in the central Arava Desert. Located along the Jordanian border, this area gets about an inch of rain a year. And believe it or not, local farmers use that to their advantage. From here to Europe, the distance is so short. It's, it's a so natural market for Israel. We are here ahead of everybody because of the weather. Despite the conditions, 500 farming families here produce 60% of Israel's fresh vegetable exports and 10% of its cut flower market. We grow summer crops during the winter time. Mayan Kidron oversees flower research that helps find alternative crops to improve the farmer's harvest in the Arava. We've got a new ideas, a new uh, production, a new products that we, uh, we have. For example, this small round pepper, we call it Twitty. That's the name of the variety, Twitty. Round pepper, that's another option for the farmers to grow. Each year, hundreds of people in the agriculture business visit a giant exhibition at Moshav Hatseva to learn about experiments and technology. Entrepreneur Boaz Wachtel hopes to improve plant growth by regulating root temperature. Each plant has an optimal temperature that it performs in that uh, range. Water pipes run along the roots, bringing cool water in summer and warmer water in winter. When you keep that root at that certain range and you prevent the fluctuations of day and night temperature and summer and winter, then the plant performs wonderfully and it produces more yield and a better quality and uh, the cycle is also shorter. Wachtel says he's seen great success. We produced 120 percent more uh, cucumbers, we had uh, lettuce, 35 percent more weight, 
Uh, we had basil, 30% more. We had uh, uh, tomatoes that is usually planted in October. We planted them in, 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 during the middle of the, middle of the summer. Alon Badihi is executive director of the Jewish National Fund. JNF has developed and forested the land of Israel for more than 100 years. He says it's the special commitment of these Israelis to the Arava that's making the land prosper. Without this spirit and without this belief and without this creation and innovation in agriculture, in science, in what we see in the, in the laboratory we just established together here in the Arava for the people of the Arava, it would never happen. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Arava Desert. Hello? Is this thing on? Hey kids, do you love games? And do you love discovering things? Yeah. Well, do you? Yeah. Then you're gonna love this. It's the new free Superbook Kids Bible app. You can play games, watch videos, find answers to your questions, and a whole lot more. The new Superbook Kids Bible app. Free downloads available on iTunes and Google Play now. And finally today, Regent University is launching a new undergraduate degree program in biophysical sciences, but it's not just about science. Students and academic professionals attend the Regent inaugural event, including Dr. Richard Haman, president of the Eastern Virginia Medical School. With a fully equipped scientific laboratory, this program is designed to provide students with both scientific knowledge and a strong education in ethics and humanities, training professionals to bridge the gap between science and faith. The healthcare sciences is a huge field, STEM is a huge field of national importance, but we also know that we need very well educated scientists and, and individuals who can think deeply about science and the humanities and theology and faith in public policy, in think tanks, in government, in other areas. So we want students to be able to do all of those. Dr. Jerson Marano Riano says it is not simply a matter of bridging the gap between faith and science, but a call to explore and proclaim the greatness of this world that's been created. Well, that is going to do it for CBN News today. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. Thanks so much for watching. Make it a wonderful Wednesday.